In this video, we will be talking about investing in NFTs, how to determine the value of a crypto artwork, what are the signs that an NFT will increase in value, and how to potentially even make millions with NFT investments. Now before we go on, and I cannot stress this enough, this is not a get rich quick type of video. We will talk about some strategies that people have used to indeed make millions in the NFT art market, but the chances of you copying those strategies and also make millions are fairly small. Because these strategies are very risky and therefore not your best recommendation to become a millionaire or anything like that. There are two strategies in this video, the research strategy and the power law strategy. Now the research strategy is the oldest one and has been going on in the art world for the last decades slash centuries. And then we have the million dollar power law strategy that is perhaps a little bit too risky to be called a real strategy in the first place. So let's start off with the research strategy. When it comes to investing in art, you want to decrease the likelihood of your investment to go down and increase the likelihood of your investment to go up in value. And the best way to do this is to make sure that the conditions of the artwork that you want to buy are as similar as possible to the conditions you find in other valuable artwork. And with similarities, we don't mean similarities within the artwork itself. We mean similarities in the career of the artworks, their network of art dealers and art collectors, their business decisions, their exhibition history, etc., etc. We basically want to search for signs of success. And so what are these signs? What are these similarities to search for? Well, in order to make it easy for you, I've categorized them in five categories. The career of the artist the quality of the artwork itself, supply and demand around the artwork, the marketing capacity of the artists and dealers and collectors surrounding the art, and finally, the time of creation. So let's start off with the career of the artist. What are some of the things that you look for in an artist's career? First, we look at the exhibition history of the artist. Has the artist participated in any group shows or solo shows in galleries, museums, or other institutions? Generally speaking, solo shows are valued the most when it comes to exhibitions. Then we look at who owns the art. Are these private collectors? Are these corporate collectors? And, and are any of the people owning these artworks famous? And what is the marketing capacity that these owners have? And do they something with that? Do they market the art of the artist? This can go from sharing their work on Instagram and social media pages to inviting them to events that they organize or are, are affiliated with. And obviously, the more yeses that you get to any of these questions, the more valuable the art becomes. Now, besides the things that I just mentioned, there are 20, 30, 40 other things that you have to look out for. And so I'm not going to sum them all up. Otherwise, this video would be way too long and way too boring. But I have listed them on a PDF that you can get by going to my website. I'm just kidding. I've listed them in the description of this video. And so whenever you feel like you can check them out when, when, when you have more time, go more in depth on them or just have them with you while you're watching this video. Now, one thing important to notice when you're checking out this list is that the price of the artwork is not listed because it's not a metric for the value of the artwork. If you look at the artists that were featured in famous magazines 50 years ago and were selling their art at price points of 10K and above that, most of those artists are now completely worthless and that will happen with the NFT space as well because most of the NFT artists that are now selling at higher price points that are kind of hyped actually have no foundation in the art world and so they will not maintain their value let alone increase in value over time. The second part that we have to talk about is the quality of the artwork itself. Now, generally speaking, as a beginner collector, this is extremely hard because in order to do this, you need an extensive knowledge of art history, of, of the contemporary art market in order to place these artworks in the canon of the art. And so this is simply impossible to cover in, in, in one YouTube video. But I can give you some basic tips that will already do a lot of damage. Generally speaking, you want to collect original artworks instead of open edition type of things, limited edition prints or multiples of the same NFT, the same digital artwork, all of the type of stuff will probably not be worth that much. You can also go for the earliest works of particular artists or the most important works of that artist. Because the most important works of an artist will be significant 
significantly worth more than his lesser known works. A drawing of Picasso, for example, Yes, sure, it's, it's, it's of Picasso, but it will be worth much less than an important work of a lesser known artist. Just like a small work of Bebo or a work out of his limited edition series will not be worth a lot of money in the future. Even though one Bebo just sold for 69 million dollars. And so this is a big mistake that people are making when they're buying NFT artworks. They will be buying works of famous NFT artists, small, limited edition series type of works. When in reality, those works will never be worth a lot of money just because of the type of work that you're buying. Now in the traditional art world, the most important works of an artist are generally speaking, the bigger works that they made on canvas where they spend a lot of time on. And so in the NFT space, that is going to be the same thing. It might be tempting, for example, to spend a lot of money on a pixelated artwork because there's a hype around pixelated artworks at this moment and they fetch quite insanely high prices to be honest but those hypes will go away they will fade away and the most important works of an artist they will stay again to take people for example if you look at the every day's project that is clearly one of his most important works where he spent an insane amount of time on 13 years to be more precise and so that will be one of people's most expensive artworks no matter what happens moving on another thing that we want to talk about is the supply and demand thing now this used to be extremely extremely hard to know because the art world was so closed. It used to be the case that you had to know the arts and get access to their sales track records or have access to the gallerist who wants to provide it to you or get insider info from other venues like art fairs or auction houses and things like that. And then Instagram came along and made it a little bit easier because now all those art world secrets were hidden in the hashtags of Instagram. You can, for example, go to a branded hashtag of an artist and then look at how many art collectors, how many people are sharing their work in their homes or, or other venues. And so just by looking at those hashtags, you can see kind of how many collectors are collecting that particular artist. Now it's true that Instagram brought more transparency, but not in the same way the blockchain is bringing transparency. On the blockchain, everything is connected. All transactions are recorded and publicly available. And so scanning for supply and demand becomes very, very easy. And so this is definitely something that you should be using and something that most NFT investors are not really appreciating the same way traditional art collectors are because they simply don't know how hard it used to be. Now, to be fair, searching for a high demand in the art that you want to buy is probably not the most cutting edge advice you've ever Ever heard, but what you might not know is how you can actually do that. What are some of the indicators of a high demand in the NFT space? Well, there are a couple of things. One of them is the sales frequency. Not only the frequency with which the art is selling, but also the amount of resells an artwork gets. More resells suggest that the owners get a lot of offers for that particular artwork, which results in them being more inclined to sell it and then also selling it more often, which is why you see a higher sales frequency. Another thing to look for is the amount of artworks that are available, which is something that you can just see because on the blockchain, everything is publicly available. And then the final thing to look for is the amount of offers a collector is getting for that particular artwork. Now, sometimes you will be able to see that, but more often than not, you will have to ask that to those collectors because that information will most of the times only be visible for the owners of a particular NFT. Moving on to the fourth category that we want to take a look at, which is the marketing capacity of the artist as well as the people who are involved in the art. We are talking about the dealers, the art collectors, and anybody who is connected to the arts because they have vested interest and want to see the value of that art going up over time. And so what are we looking for? What qualities do these people need to have? Well, we are looking for people who understand the art market, who understand the business principles needed for becoming an artist. We are basically looking for people who understand what it takes. People who know how to build a community, people who understand that they have to be in it for the long term instead of some quick money grabbing type of thing. In other words, people who have been dealing with art for a very long time, not some 18 year old artist who just came out of 
art school and happens to have some talent and, 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 and be promising to some extent. The truth is that those promising artists usually end up being worthless in the end. And finally, we are searching for an artist that has enough work ethic to execute on all of the things that we just mentioned. An artist might have the right ideas, but if he doesn't have the, the power to execute on them, then those are these are just worthless. And so ironically, this already excludes 99% of NFT arts that we see out there. Then the final thing that we want to take a look at is the timetable of the activity. When was the artwork created and when was it offered as an NFT? Now you might ask yourself, why do we want to do that? Well, basically we want to know if it is the first of something because being the first artwork of a particular artwork, art, mm, artwork of a particular artwork, artwork of a particular artist being the first or one of the first NFTs that an artist has created is also generally speaking going to be more valuable than the average type of artwork that he has created. If you look at art movements for example you see that the first artist of a particular movement always are the most valuable ones. If you look at the first impressionist painters like Claude Monet or the overly sexy and attractive Auguste Renoir we see see that their paintings reach insanely high price points. The five most expensive paintings of Claude Monet, for example, have sold for over $400 million combined. And this is not only true for the first artist of a particular movement, but also as said for the first artworks of a particular artist. And by the way, not just for art, but for everything. A Pokemon card with the first edition stamp will be worth way more than the exact same Pokemon card printed one week later without the first edition stamp. Now before we go on to the last chapter and talk about the power law strategy, I quickly want to talk about two things that are going to be very useful in your research. The first one is or are auction house sales records. Here's the thing, gathering all the info that we talked about is simply not going to be enough. You also need to interpret that information and the best way to do that is to compare it to the art careers of established artists. Much like you would do when you buy real estate, for example. If you buy real estate, you will look at what other houses of the same size in the same region have sold for. And so I would highly recommend to check out those online databases where you can get access to the sales records of major auction houses and then compare the price point of the NFT art that you want to buy to to similar artworks of the same price point and then compare those art careers to one another. Now the downside to these records is that they will only give you insights in already very established art careers and so it's going to be very hard to compare emerging NFT artists with, with very established art careers. The second thing I want to mention before we move on is to be very careful with the measurement mania that is going on nowadays. Everyone tries to measure everything and put everything in graphs. People obsess about weekly views, likes and subscriber gains, monthly email conversion rates, supply and demand graphs, quarterly earning reviews and all of that stuff. The problem with those numbers is that you can easily hit them and still overlook the deeper, harder to measure things that threaten the durability of an art business. The problem is that growth is easy to measure, but durability isn't. The artist might be extremely good on paper, for example, but have very bad social skills and almost no respect for the people surrounding them. And as a result, six months from now, this particular artist will lose all of his friends except for his wife and his best friend. And on top of that, six months later, he finds out that his wife is cheating on him with his best friend, resulting in him going into a depression that ends his art career completely. Now this is of course a very extreme example, but not an unrealistic one. I guess what I want to say is that Durability is probably the most important metric, but the hardest one to measure. And so don't obsess too much of, over all the numbers and all of the data that you will be gathering. Moving on, let's talk about the final strategy, the power law strategy, the strategy that could potentially turn hundreds into millions. If you look at the art career of people, of ferocious or other hyped up NFT artists, you might have noticed something, namely that you don't see any of the things that I mentioned in the research strategy in their art career. 
They didn't have any exhibitions, let alone solo exhibitions. They didn't participate in any art fairs. They have no one in the academic community that is backing them up and writing about them. None of them won awards. They don't have art collectors or dealers representing them or selling their work. And prior to their NFT experience, they had no sales track records of individual original art that was being sold for decent price points. And so according to anything that has summed up in this video, investing in Beeble or Ferocious would have been an insanely bad investment except for the fact that it clearly wasn't because people sold for 69 million dollars. And so how can we foresee these type of things? Is it possible to be ahead of the curve and calculate it and buy these things before they skyrocket to the moon? Now the short answer is no, you cannot predict these things unless you have inside information that is telling you that the $69 million deal is a closed deal before the event happens. But is it possible to increase your chances drastically of something like this happening up until the, to the point that you can actually start talking about a strategy where you can expect some decent returns with? Well, the short answer is yes. And that brings us to the power law strategy. Now, interestingly enough, this tactic doesn't come from an art investor, but comes from a startup investor, namely Peter Thiel, who founded PayPal together with Elon Musk and some, some other smart asses. Now, what Peter Thiel observed when comparing different investment funds that were investing in startups is that in each and every single one of those funds, a handful of companies, one or two, were responsible for all the profits. In the majority of investment funds, one or two companies had a bigger return than all the other companies in the portfolio combined. And so this is very different than what you would see with traditional stock portfolios where you hopefully have a lot of companies that give you a smaller but decent return. Now, if you look at the portfolios of art collectors who are investing in emerging artists, you see the same patterns occurring. A couple of artists, a handful of artists, being responsible for all the profits in that portfolio. And out of these observations, Peter Thiel came up with two rules that he uses to invest. By the way, you can read all of his strategies and, and, and all of his advice in an amazing book called Zero to One, which I highly recommend. And take in mind that I have translated these rules and made them applicable in the arts. And so this topic is definitely not a representation of the topic in his book. It, the book is a business book. Anyway, the first rule is, only invest in art that has the potential to return the value of the entire portfolio combined. In other words, don't try to diversify your portfolio in these types of situations because you want outliers instead of safety. Knowing very well that the majority will go down to zero, but a couple will make up for all of those losses. Now this rule is pretty scary because it eliminates almost all successful artists out there and goes completely against the, everything that I said in the research strategy, the first part of this video. And the second rule of the Peter Thiel strategy is because the first rule is so restrictive, there cannot be any other rules. And so thinking about these two rules, we can understand why the people who are investing in crypto art are predominantly crypto people who don't understand anything about art, but understand the future of the world extremely well. They are not able to invest in art, but they are able to use the power law structure of Peter Thiel and benefit from the first mover advantage of the NFT space. Now again, this strategy is borderline gambling and of course not an investment investment recommendation or anything like that. This video is purely educational and not trying to turn viewers into millionaires. Now, in order to make this video complete, we should not only talk about the principles of investing, but also about the practical side of investing. Which crypto art marketplaces should you use to invest in crypto art? Which websites should you use to do research? And what are the best underground places to find the next big artists? And so we should be talking about all of those things, but that would be another 15 minutes and frankly, completely different video. And so I'm very sorry, but we're not going to do that predominantly because I already did. It's called best crypto art marketplaces. And you can be watching that right now. Hope to see you there. Ciao, ciao.